This video is brought to you by Knowledge at the Australian School of Business. For more information, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au. He's a man that racked up millions of frequent flyer points traveling the globe chasing Australian international business success for Austrade. In doing so, he unraveled the economic life of many of the countries that he visited in a work that proves that financial textbooks needn't be dry. I'm talking, of course, about the airport economist. Now he's joining the Australian School of Business as a J.W. Neville Fellow in Economics. Tim Harcourt joins me now. Now, Tim, you've been at Austrade. Obviously, you've been at the Reserve Bank. How does that shape your view of economics and world trade? Well, I'm lucky because I've been at the Reserve Bank in Austrade and also the ACTU. So you get very different perspectives. I guess in many ways it's a, a good co continuity. The Reserve Bank was all about uh, keeping the Australian economy stable. The ACTU was all about getting workers better wages. And Austrade's been about looking for export opportunities for the future to create the jobs for future workers. And so I, th I see the, the career is quite, all, all quite consistent and obviously all you know, very much tied to the economy. And of course, while you've been travelling the world for it, then of course you've been writing The Airport Economist. I almost feel we ought to be doing this in the Qantas Club or perhaps the Chairman's Lounge. Now, what's really stood out for you while you've been writing The Airport well, I'm, Economist? Well, I'm, I'm still a good Qantas Club boy, mate. Well, yeah. but, uh, <laughs> but anyway, I do get upgraded sometimes. <laughs> but uh, look, The Airport Economist is all about, you know, you go to so many countries. I think I've been to 56 countries in the last five years. And so you see every economy for a day, or in Mongolia's case, two days. And people say, well, what do you think? And you've got to pretty much, you know, capture the essence of that country pretty quickly. And I made a bit of a joke like, well, I've seen lots of airports, uh, but it's better than the alternative. Um, I had a colleague at graduate school who was an Indian fertility expert, and he won all these prizes. And I said, so you must go to India a lot? And he said, no, no, I've never left the United States. I haven't got a passport. I thought, my gosh, you know, so an airport economist has not been perfect. You know, you, you, you don't see a lot of the world, but at least you're going. And that's better than being an armchair economist. But can you actually get much of a sense of how the economy of a country is going when you're just getting a snapshot for a day and then you're already back in the departure lounge having a nice cup of coffee? Well, you can in a sense if you, if you cast your net widely. Because um, of my background, uh, I've good networks. So I talk to the central banks. I talk to the, the trade unions. Uh, I talk to Australian businesses who are there. I talk to community groups and NGOs. So I think I have a, a good wide net to liaise with. And then, you know, with the economic analysis on top and good points of comparison. I mean, the question I get when I go all around the world is not, what do, you, what do I think of Australia? It's, what do you think of China? I can be in Colombia, I can be in South Africa. What's your view on China? And uh, I think Australia's strong links with Asia, and particularly China, has made us very attractive. It certainly has, but has Australia's real push into Asia always been the unqualified success it's portrayed to be? Well, I think you've got to say it has. I mean, the famous historian Geoffrey Blaney in 1966 wrote this book called The Tyranny of Distance, saying how far we were from England and North America, and that was our terrible handicap for us. And that was the year that Japan took over Britain as Australia's number one export destination. And so now I've been wanting people to talk about the power proximity because we basically opened up our economy with Bob Hawke and Paul Keating floating the dollar right when Asia became more important. So in a way, we're the lucky country, as Donald Horn said in that same time, but we're the lucky country that made its own luck. But nevertheless, we are very dependent on China. It's now our largest export market. Correct. If they, well, they even start sneezing, we're going to catch a cold. Well, a lot of it is, um, you know, a lot of it is long-term construction projects. You know, China is moving a lot of its economic activity to the west, to the, the second and third tier cities, which, you know, I get told they're country towns and you go there, there's eight million people, you know. And they need roads and civil buildings and airports. And, you know, they basically need to grow those cities and that means there's construction projects built in for a long time. And if China's growth slows, it's actually probably would be a good thing because it will take away some of the inflationary issues that they've got in China at the moment. Yeah, but it's already slowed now twice, two quarters in a row. That's really getting some people a little bit twitchy. Well, to some extent, um, it will take some heat out of it. But to another extent, I think the whole issue we've had with the global economy, with the global financial crisis has been... China wants to move from being export-orientated to more 
domestic you know, consumption and investment, and that's part of this process. Um, in some ways, you could talk about the whole structural change in the economy as America having too many shoppers and not enough shippers, China having too many shippers and not enough shoppers. So we're just trying to change that balance so there's more domestic consumption in China and less in America. Oh, certainly. But equally, America's had the problem with a housing bubble there that, of course, crashed. Now people are talking about China being in a very similar situation where property prices just keep on rising. When you've been visiting China, have you noticed that? Well, then, then it's not the same as the States because there's very unusual institutional reasons for China's housing issues. It's partly to do with when you move to a larger city, there are certain rules about to what extent you have to rent for, to what extent you have to buy. And that causes distortions, and that's, that's quite unique to China. But uh, in, in some ways, you know, when I first went to China as a union official years ago, um, I went to a factory and uh, I said to them, do you have workers' compensation in China? And it got translated, the interpreter came back and said, no, if the workers broke anything, you don't have to compensate us. And <laughs> you could say that then yeah. because you had a reserve army of labour. Now we've actually got labour shortages in, in parts of China, you know, in certain skill areas, and that's, uh, that's putting pressure. And that's why you, you've seen this great debate over whether do you revalue the currency or do you risk wage and price pressures at home? And that's what China's grappling with. And are we going to continue this trend of Australia's dependence on China? It's with Dr Ken Henry, of course, carrying out his review of the Asian century. Well, I think it's, it's not China only. It's China plus. I think it's you know, China, India, ASEAN... Increasingly, the emerging economies of Central Asia, Africa, Latin America, the Middle East. So in some ways, uh, I think Ken Henry's review will be about widening and deepening because it's not going to be just rocks and crops. It's not just going to be mining and uh, LNG. It's now going to be education, the industry we're in, uh, professional services, architecture, different uh, technology that feeds into agribusiness and mining. So I think it's about widening and deepening the relationship and also using our strengths in uh, Asia to make ourselves more attractive uh, internationally. But do we have those strengths? As I've heard this described as boratonomics, of where simply we dig stuff out of the ground, <laughs> hand it on to China, and then we're very grateful for the cheap consumer goods we can import. Yeah, that was the title I was going to use for my Kazakhstan yeah. article, but uh, very good. Um, I think um, what people forget, you know, I mean, at the time of the Sydney Olympics, everyone said, oh, Australia's too old economy. It's just got mining and farming and the sooner it closes them all down and becomes a software manufacturer like Taiwan, the better it will be. And I think Carly Farini, the head of Hewlett Packard, said that the dollar would be 30 cents by 2011 unless we became more new economy. Now, when she said that, of course, we had our biggest terms of trade boom in our history. And I think what that misses out is that a lot of the um, technology and services you produce around mining and agriculture are themselves important exporters. You know, I go to Mendoza, Argentina, and there's a South Australian viticulture marketing company helping the Argentine winemakers. You go to um, Siberia and there's Perth-based small businesses providing technology and equipment to the exploration sector. So I think there's plenty of, you know, sexy IT knowledge-based industries. It just happens that they service um, extractive industries. Let's broaden out this now to actually talk about the global economy because a double-dip recession, there's been a lot of talk that it's going to be happening. The US really isn't looking at all healthy and Europe, of course, has got all the debt crises. Are you concerned that the world may go into a double-dip recession? Well, there's, there's talk about it. I mean, I think they're predominantly structural issues that we're seeing as we move towards the emerging economies. I think you're right to mention Europe. Um, I wrote a piece about this, my big fat Greek debt which basically the issue goes to, can you expect a seven-year-old uh, German factory worker in Dusseldorf working in the snow to pay for a 51-year-old Greek's public servant's pension who's retired, living it up in Greece? I, I, think that's, I think that's a real difficulty. And I think once they tied people together with the euro, they had to really think about those implications. That At the end of the day, they're not going to let it all collapse but it's a really serious fiscal reason. Uh, the, US dif the US reasons are quite, are quite different. It's one country, so they don't have those same fiscal issues, but they've got, they've got real structural issues with their institutions. And in many ways, that the hands-off uh, approach in the financial services sector uh, is a real issue for the, for the US, something that we didn't have here and something that they didn't have in Canada. Very similar banking system to Australia, similar economy to the US, but they, had, they have their financial house in order. So... 
perhaps uh, some of our traditions have held us up quite well here. So where do you stand on the light-touch banking regulation? After all, when the economy was booming, it stood many economies in very good stead and they got a lot of cash from it. Mm. Now, of course, it looks as if Australia came up very well by having tight regulation. Do you always feel that tight regulation is justified? I think you've always got to update regulation in institutions. You can't keep it the same for, for 100 years, you know. So you've constantly got to be reforming um, all institutions in your economy but uh, going straight hands off, I don't think works, and I don't think you want to become East Germany. You know, you don't want to be overly controlled. And Australia, for the most part, has got that pretty much right. But we've had, you know, we had the Campbell Review and the Martin Review. We, we, we're constantly, uh, we've had just the Super Review with, with Jeremy Cooper. So we're, we're constantly updating our institutions and having a good look at them. And that's, uh, that's important. And for the most part, uh, we've been pretty pragmatic about it. But you, of course, are a former trade unionist. and uh, I am. I've, I've got to ask you well, about... I'm still a trade unionist, oh, okay. but, I'm, I'm, but I'm a former trade union economist. You're quite right. And I've yeah. got to ask you about yeah. protectionism because yeah. now for those economies that are really yeah. suffering, there yeah. are many people who are arguing that protectionism should be the way we should go and much tighter labour laws. Where do you stand on that? Well, you know, this will be the theme of the Stan Kelly Memorial Lecture uh, that I'm giving for the Economic Society. And, um, you yeah, know, the most important thing, I think, in Australia is that the reason that we had a successful opening up of our economy is that we had reasonable protection for workers, but not for markets. Because I believe you should have uh, appropriate labour market institutions to protect the rights of uh, uh, workers at the workplace, and because, you know, bargaining power is never fair. But I don't believe in protecting markets. And so I believe in an open economy, free trade, but with free trade unions and appropriate minimum wage settings and so on. And I think for the most part, Australia's managed to open up its economy, reduce tariffs, but at the same time it's brought in appropriate superannuation, Medicare and good, sound labour laws so that people get a fair go. But we've seen a loss of a large number of manufacturing jobs in Australia. Are those laws really working when we've got situations such as Blue Scope Steel, Pacific Brands, a lot of jobs being lost there? Yeah, there are, but at the same time we've actually built up a manufacturing and export sector in Australia that we never had before. And if you look at the labour market, um, the companies that are export orientated pay 60% higher wages, better health and safety, they're more likely to be unionised. So my message would be that workers and their unions have a, have a stake uh, in an export orientated economy and ultimately there is transitions that take place and people should be treated fairly, but at the end of the day you, you've got to go for growth. Better to argue over an expanding pie than a shrinking one. And that's the danger you have when you become a protectionist. You know, we're still, as the Americans say, gone from, you know, down under to down under. We've still got the power proximity in our favour. We've still got all the things the world wants and we're in the right place at the right time. So I think structurally we're well placed. We have to work out these transitions that take place. We do have to ensure that, uh, you know, people don't get badly hurt at Blue Scope and uh, Pacific Brands and so on. We do have to ensure that um, our services sector is constantly looking at ways of improving productivity. We have to always expand our universities and our business schools so they're outward looking, they're engaged with the world and um, that's all part of ways in which we can boost productivity and human capital in Australia. Tim Harcourt, the new JW Neville Fellow in Economics at the Australian School of Business. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. For more business news and analysis from Knowledge at the Australian School of Business, please visit knowledge.asb.unsw.edu.au.